would anybody want to ride a Kawasaki KLR650? It's underpowered as a scrambler. It's uh, heavy as an off-road bike. It lacks any sort of amenities that you would expect to find on a tour adventure. It's far from nimble as a commuter and with its high seat height and low torque of the engine, it's not great in stop and go traffic. In fact, I would say that this bike doesn't do anything well. So why then is it so damn fun to ride? Over 150,000 riders worldwide have made the Kawasaki KLR650 their own. So what makes it one of the worst single purpose bikes you can buy, yet one of the best dual purpose machines in the world? I'm Rod and I've owned hundreds of motorcycles over my 40 years of riding. And last year I finally bought and restored a badly abused 2013 KLR650. Now it's been a long time since I've owned a dual sport or anything close to an off-road bike. And this has left me wondering why the f I didn't do this sooner. Today I'm going to try to pass on some tips to you about setting up your bike for the type of riding I do in the Northwest and show you some of the accessories that I installed on this bike to make it my own. Plus, I'm going to tell you why that despite everything I just said about how great this bike is to ride, that this is my last KLR650 video. Thanks for clicking on the video. This is Rod Rides and Wrenches. Okay, let's revisit the KLR history one more time. Originally cloned from what was basically a three-year production prototype bike called the KL or KLR600, depending on where you lived in the world, Kawasaki took various parts like suspension and frames from motocross and street bikes in its current production and combined them with a brand new first-in-class water-cooled four-valve 564cc thumper single, all at a price that was less money in the showroom than the competition's air-cooled bikes. This bike was definitely geared toward the off-pavement rider though, with a kickstart only engine and 34-inch seat height. But it reignited a segment that by 1985 other Japanese manufacturers were content to just let die. In 1987, the KLR650 rolled out to showrooms and along with 88ccs of additional displacement, electric start and rear disc brakes to match the front hydraulic disc, it still rode high in the saddle with over nine inches of suspension travel, but it was a manageable machine in the woods at only 337 pounds dry weight. It didn't take long for riders to start testing the potential of this bike in the real world. At just under 3,500 bucks new, the KLR was affordable, but not cheap, despite it being under the Reaganomics engine displacement tariffs on Japanese bikes. And that was what we did four years ago. You asked us to give you breathing room so you could finish getting into shape to meet unexpectedly strong foreign competition. In 2001, manufacturing of the KLR was moved to Thailand to help keep the bike priced at the pointy end of the competition. Over the decades, Kawasaki has tried new things out on the KLR. It made a desert scrambler version called the Tan Guy with a fender mounted low just over the front tire, then a stripped down version designated as the C, which I think is still one of the best looking KLRs. It came with a smaller fuel tank and a simpler gauge cluster and an overall cleaner look that is more hyper motard than trail bike. Kawasaki also made a reported 200 diesel engine versions of the KLR for the US military to take to Iraq. Who knows though how many of these bikes actually saw action since there seems to be a fair number of the 200 made still in the United States. Unless that is, all the pictures that I see online are just the same bike in different locations. In 2008, the KLR received its first major upgrade. The plastics, electrical system, suspension and brakes were all tweaked, but the core of the bike, the 650cc engine was pretty much left alone. In 2018, the last carbureted KLR650 rolled off the assembly line in Thailand amid all sorts of speculation that the KLR650 could not meet emissions requirements and so it was being axed. The real reason is still yeah. unknown. Now, Kawasaki did shift production in the Thailand factory to relaunch the Ninja 250, which was only sold in Asia, and the newer Ninja 400, but there were rumors on the internet that the KLR650 production never actually stopped, and it was still being sold and available in Thailand as a 2018 model all the way up to 2020. In 2022, the KLR was relaunched with a facelift, fuel injection, a beefed up frame, plus a number of other unseen updates to improve durability off-road, which resulted in about 54 pounds of added beef. At its core, still a KLR, and it's still one of the most reasonably priced 
big boy or big girl bikes that you can buy starting at just $68.99. Best of all, it has to be one of the best investments in a motorcycle since used KLRs don't appear to depreciate that much. A 2018 second gen KLR in good shape on average will still set you back over five grand. With all this in mind, I set out to build the most reliable second gen KLR 650 and equip it with a few accessories to bring it into the current decade for comfort and utility. Last year I picked up a 2013 KLR with about 20,000 K. I still feel it was a score. This bike, however, it was far from pretty and as I dug into it, I kept thinking the mileage on the odometer was a little suspect or at minimum, the bike had a very hard life. When I got it, it had been sitting for a few years but it did have some nifty equipment already on it. The suspension had been upgraded out front to progressive suspension springs along with a fork brace and out back a full upgrade to the progressive 465 shock. The bike had a sergeant seat and a big skid plate, engine guard, and pannier racks. All in all, it was a decent package to start with if you looked past the leaks and rust. I set about fixing the leaks and going through all the frame and suspension pivot bearings, rebuilding the brake calipers, replacing the drive chain and sprockets, delving deeper into a much needed valve adjustment, rebuilding the clutch, as well as repairing and replacing the balance chain tensioner. If there's one thing I suggest you do to any used KLR650 you buy is to confirm the balance chain tensioner has been up upgraded to a heavier one. You can find all this work done step by step on the Rod Rides and Wrenches channel page. Now it's time to have some fun. I put together a small pile of accessories for the bike that will make it more user friendly. Give it some protection while off-roading and just make it a little more uniquely mine. Here's a list of what I've installed and I'm going to start with one of the simplest upgrades, replacing the plastic cover for the starter relay to this aluminum one. The aluminum cover is primarily cosmetic, it will match some of the other accessories I'm installing and if you install one of these covers on your own bike, I would recommend rotating the positive battery lead 90 degrees forward just to make sure it won't ground out against the aluminum cover if the bike should ever fall over on that side. Now I did use a cable tie to secure the rubber boot at this new angle. Next I installed aluminum guards on both the front and rear calipers. These caliper guards again are primarily cosmetic but they do offer some protection from gravel and sticks in the trail aimed at the caliper. Like the starter relay cover, these caliper guards are available in different anodized colors to match your bike. Also installed was this aluminum heat shield that can replace the factory heat shield or just be installed over top the factory shield as an accent. The factory shield on my bike was so badly rusted I had to remove it and install this much lighter aluminum shield instead. Another addition, which is part cosmetic, part practical protection, was the headlight guard. The aluminum grille makes the bike look tough while protecting the headlight from rocks thrown up by other riders ahead of you or small tree limbs that are crossing the trail. One of the most important upgrades I think you can make to the bike though for a minor amount of money is the foot pegs. These foot pegs are CNC machined from 6063 T6 aircraft grade aluminum which has a tensile strength of 35,000 psi. They are four and a quarter inches long and 2.4 inches wide with adjustable grip pins that you thread in yourself for the level of grip that you want. I'm adding about half the pins for now and find them very good. They are also very comfortable, especially when standing. The wide platform allows you to comfortably position your foot and more easily transfer your weight while riding. When I reinstalled my front forks on the KLR, I set them higher in the steering yokes by about an inch. This placement drops the front of the bike lower, making it easier to get on and off the bike especially when riding on the trail. I am personally not a big fan of lowering links to adjust the height of the suspension, so I'm leaving the rear suspension height alone. Even with the rear suspension at standard height, I will need to shorten the side stand on the KLR by at least an inch and a half. This adjustable kickstand will allow me to dial in the height I need, and since it is as strong as the stock kickstand, I don't lose any functionality. On a strictly protection side, I installed this aluminum radiator cover. It lends some strength to the factory plastic guard and will prevent most sticks from getting up into the radiator and ruining your day. The new aluminum guard just bolts to the factory plastic and the manufacturer also supplied some cable ties to limit vibration if the bolts ever came loose. I think a bit of thread lock will do the job though.
one of the options offered on a brand new KLR650 are power and USB outlets. I thought I would do the same on this 2013 by adding this accessory dash panel with some power plugs as well as a battery voltage monitor and ambient temperature display. I wired up a direct line from the battery to this DIN 12 volt power socket. This will allow me to plug in power accessories, but my primary use will be to charge and maintain the battery. Also on a direct circuit to the battery, I installed an 18 watt USB power outlet that will charge my phone or any other device through USB. Both these outlets are waterproof and the USB charger has its own separate power switch. On an ignition switch circuit, I hooked up the battery monitor and temperature gauge I mentioned, as well as some heated grips. I have a link to the aluminum dash panel available in green or black, plus the plugs and gauges, as well as all the accessories installed below in this video's description. The heated grip switch I could have installed installed on this panel, but instead I installed a waterproof handlebar mounted switch that is closer to the left grip for easier access to turn on and adjust the heated grip temperature when I'm riding. Being on the ignition circuit, the heated grips don't run down the battery if I ever leave them on. After rebuilding the clutch and replacing all the water pump seals in my last video, I mentioned I would be flushing the cooling system and installing Blue Engine Ice High Performance Coolant, which I can say now certainly makes a difference. But in the cooler weather I had when I shot this video, it might be overkill since the bike runs significantly cooler. Now I will be flushing the coolant and installing blue ice on my Ninja ZX14 this year though since this beast can get seriously hot. Finally when I replace the chains and sprockets on this bike I went with a stock 1543 tooth ratio on the sprockets. I have since dropped a tooth on the front sprocket to run a 1443 ratio. Dropping the front tooth has made the bike much easier to ride on trail and it will still comfortably do 70 miles per hour on the highway. If you ride off road, I would recommend doing the same and you will see that the bike becomes much, much easier to ride at slow speeds, navigating through rough terrain, and trail ruts or running up steep hills. Now, if I were to sum up my experience so far with the KLR, I'm going to have to tell you that it is a great bike, perhaps all time great adventure bike. I mean, it costs thousands less than a BMW GS 800 or KTM Adventure 790. And it can't be argued that the Kawasaki delivers way more bike for the money. Look, if you truly want to do some adventure riding on roads and trails that are not found on your GPS, then this is the price range of bike that's not going to make you cringe every time you slide it over a rock or plow it through some brush. And it costs half as much as my BMW GS1200. I would also argue that it's more fun to ride because it weighs less and has better off-road handling. Now, is it as fun to ride down the twisting highway as my 1200 GS or even an 800 GS for that matter? No, of course not. It lacks a lot of amenities that you'd find on those bikes, but a lot of those things can be added at a reasonable price and still save you thousands of dollars. In fact, by the time you kit one of these bikes up, you still have a few years of insurance and gas to pay for before you come close to those bikes. This bike is relatively easy to work on, which means it's easy to live with. So is the KLR650 the best adventure bike out there? Well, maybe. I mean, it does deliver everything that you need in a decades proven package that is reliable and versatile. It also delivers all this stuff at a price that won't require you to work weekends just so you can keep the payments up on it. So why then is this my last KLR650 video? Well, to sum things up, I'm done. I'm done fixing this bike and now it's time to go for a ride. So you may see it again in a future video, but for now I've shared with you everything that I think you need to know in order to get one of these bikes yourself and put it back out on the road or down the trail. Look, if you've missed any of the past videos on this bike, you can go to the Rod Rides and Wrenches channel and find the KLR650 playlist. And whatever bike you do ride, be sure to ride safe.